Good evening, and welcome to the Faculty Research Seminar of Science Europe. My name is Eric Jones, and I'm a professor of European Studies. Now, one of the things that we've been trying to do in the European and Eurasian Studies program has been to integrate the study of Central and Eastern Europe together with the study of Western Europe, with the idea being that European Studies is no longer just France, Germany, Italy, and the United Kingdom. It's a whole vast continent of different peoples, all of whom are going through very many similar things and, and, and trying to figure out from each of these different individual groups what lessons we can learn is going to make life better for all of us. Now, this is a project that we've been doing uh, since the 1990s, and it's something that we've been doing in earnest for about the last 10 years when we brought Russia and Eurasia studies uh, and European studies together in one big program. And, and it's part of our ambition to make sure to foster a conversation that draws on region-specific expertise, but, but generates, generates dialogue across uh, all parts of Europe. And, and, and there's never been a more important time for us to do that than today. Because if you were to look at the European Union right now, what you would see is that there are enormous divisions between North and South, but there are also enormous divisions between East and West. And these divisions in Europe, North, South, East, West, are causing problems for the whole project of the European Union. Problems that are interfering with the ability of European countries to coordinate in responding to the novel coronavirus pandemic, for example. And, and, and so we need to understand these divisions and we need to understand how these divisions can be overcome if we're gonna be able to push this European project forward or if we're gonna be able to anticipate how it's gonna develop. Now, in the service of that objective, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to have with us this evening uh, Dr. Veronica Angle. Dr. Veronica Angle is well known to many of you at SAIS because she's been working with me over the past two years to develop the risk degree program, both in its, uh, its sort of in-person version and in the live action version. Um, but what many of you may not know is that Veronica started life, uh, or at least professional life, uh, as, a, as a political advisor rather than as a student of politics. Uh, working alongside Romanian President Klaus Ioannis, uh, <laughs> and, and in doing so brings a healthy dose of practical experience uh, in, into the study of politics as well. She did her PhD at the University of Bucharest. It was uh, awarded a prize as the best dissertation presented that year. She's had fellowships with us at Johns Hopkins, but but much more impressively uh, as a Fulbright scholar at Stanford and now as a Max Weber fellow at the European University Institute. It's small wonder therefore with this variety of experience that the European Consortium for Political Research has identified Veronica as a rising star in, in the community of political science. Uh, and, and what I've asked Veronica to do is not necessarily give us a political science paper, uh, but, but rather give us a, a, a good sense involving political science, but, but focusing more on, on what, what's going on in political reality uh, of what's happening in, in Central and Eastern Europe. And, and, and the paper that she's promised to deliver is one that's called Fake It Till You Make It, uh, and, and looks at the experience of, of democracy and demo democratization uh, in Central and Eastern Europe. And I hope you'll join me in welcoming her, although we probably won't hear you given this online format. Veronica, it's so terrific to have you. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Eric. You can hear me, right? Just not so I can be sure. Okay, thank you. And then thank you, size colleagues, for showing up for this talk. I was, I was sure I could come to Bologna today. I'm literally 30 minutes away in Florence. And then, then I, I stared into the void of train connections between Tuscany and Emilia Romagna and the, the void stared back at me with no solutions. So, ci siamo, as always, I am honored to be in conversation with the humans of size. You are among the, the best minds of your generation, and I, I too have become the 2.0 version of myself once I started working with, with size and with Eric. The gratitude cannot be exaggerated. So being a part of this, this community for two years now, like, like Eric mentioned, has in no little amount restored my faith. We are not just a... Um, 
lost battalion of platonic conversationalists, as, as Allen Ginsberg would, would call those who pass through universities with radiant, cool eyes, hyped on hope. Um, but we are also fixers. So we are the mechanics of politics. We are the students of risk. That is less glamorous, but that is just fine. The world has given us plenty to fix these days. So which brings me to the topic of our next um, hour or so together. Uh, since this is a conversation about democracy, and democracy is such a broad topic, and, and the region of Central and Eastern Europe is not a unitary actor for which we can make sweeping remarks, there will be plenty of loose ends by the time we end this conversation. So I will, I will raise several issues that I find important to pay attention to when we address the problems of this region and, and how these affect European integration more widely. Um, but I also learned from all my previous interactions with, with science researchers that the question, so what do we do? What's the solution here? Is just waiting around the corner. So I've tried to anticipate some of those questions coming from you. But you are a tough crowd uh, for any academic lost in abstraction. So I will save the bulk of the time that I have after these remarks for um, your interest to, to guide my answers. So I have this catchy title for the, for the lecture today, you know, fake it till you make it. Uh, that sums up a story of a, of a bad start in a good direction. Uh, notice there is a positive spin in there about the status of, of Central and Eastern Europe. The idea of making it does a lot of heavy lifting, though. Uh, we will not talk much about the positive side of the story because that is not my job. Uh, but I want to stress from the beginning before uh, we do talk about, uh, about the troublemakers and the problems of the region, that this is not exclusively a story of, of failure and decline. Uh, the uh, new EU members uh, have made great political progress given their starting point as communist regimes. So under EU accession conditionality, we did see um, a rapid promotion of democracy relative to the starting point, um, and, and the development of capitalism and free markets. So many surveys show that Central and Eastern European citizens value the basic model of liberal democracy to a degree similar to, to that in, in traditional democracies. Whether they understand liberal democracies in similar ways, that's a different question. But the most recent study that came, I think just yesterday or the day before from the European Parliament, show that when it comes to commitment to the rule of law as, as a basic principle of EU membership, the populations of new member states do not show significantly different preferences from traditional democracies. So other public attitude studies also reveal that populations in the, in the EU's eastern territories, if we may call it that way, are more, are more satisfied with their standard of living as well. And, and most importantly, the, the physical and, and legal opening of these countries towards the West allowed many individuals to, to study, to move, to work in more functioning societies. So this was an immediate effect that improved the lives of millions. And, and if we stop thinking of the EU as a set of nation states, but as a, as a mechanism that caters to the well-being of individuals, you've heard me say this before, we can move away from the awful perception that the EU accession uh, wrecked havoc among the population of Eastern Europe's villages. But this is a controversial point that usually gets me into trouble. So I will not dwell on it unless unless you push me to in, in the Q&A part. Um, but the fact that these societies are doing well enough has also led to substantial complacency. And so I see an evolution of understanding of this region like a, like a road from to wishful thinking to complacency. And this is wrong. It was wrong to assume that, that a population and its governing elites who had no or, or very little experience with democratic rule and, and with principles of social and economic liberalism could converge with, with traditional democracies of Western Europe in a matter of decades, of three decades more exactly. It's now, it is now equally wrong to take this realization and say, well, this is as good as it could have gotten. 
Eastern European citizens, whether they live in the Eastern territories of the EU, which clearly I'm trying to coin this phrase, or have migrated West, do not live in the best of all possible worlds. The trend towards um, less democracy and, and anti-human rights manifestations is real uh, in East and Central Europe. The quality and, and the durability of democracy in the region is much more contingent and conditional than, than commonly assumed. So let me share a, a quick graph. No, I, I won't share a quick graph. Uh, you don't need it. You, you, we don't have time for it. You already know that according to most indexes from, from the academic world or from units of analysis, such as the Economist Intelligence Unit, countries such as Hungary, Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, Croatia are weaker in their uh, measured uh, status of, of liberal democracy, while others have stagnated, such as Slovenia, Czechia, Slovakia, and, and the Baltic countries usually fare the best, so that's why we never talk about them. Uh, but why did this happen? As the um, 2008 Euro crisis, the, the spread of nationalism, and all promising but incoherent populist policies consume the EU, these national governing elites felt less constrained to, to respect the already fragile balance of the rule of law in, in their countries. And a deeper look at how these states and societies were at the time of the economic crisis would show that elite-driven um, illiberal agendas were not produced by these events, but were merely amplified. And so you may have had the institutions in place that could incrementally, slowly structure behavior and, and enforce equitable governing mechanisms, but how can you have democracy without Democrats? And democracy requires a, a lot of self-restraint that is not necessary codified in, in the laws or in how well countries integrated in their legislation, European and communautaire. So, such restraints are also informally codified. This is not to say that institutions don't work. On the contrary, they have had quite a transformative effect on, on elite behavior, not least because the forced political parties, um, they, they forced political parties to, to coalesce uh, as, a, as a result of proportional voting or, or, or because of turnover. But an example of how informal institution um, is, is the, uh, an, an example of an informal institution is the acceptance from democratic elites that it is okay to also lose elections some of the time. And now I'm not talking about Donald Trump and the, the US mess, uh, but about the very clear difficulty of Eastern European governing elites to accept turnovers. So the case of Hungary is the most acute one. Uh, the uh, Orban government and the Fidesz elites changed the electoral law in time for the 2014 um, elections, among other things, so that fewer seats could be awarded to smaller and non-incumbent parties. Now, as they head to re-election in 2022, they aim once more to diminish further the chances of smaller parties to make uh, gains by, by introducing requirements to receive votes in, in a certain number of constituencies. In Romania, the approach is more savage, less elegant. So there the horror of losing elections is so high that according to some studies our colleagues have made, every fifth legislator has performed party switching with people changing parties to, to secure a new mandate six or seven times in their careers. And, and you know, even mayors at, um, at local elections change parties before in the hundreds, by the hundreds. So to run on the list of the party that scores highest in electoral preferences that respective year. This is one example of practices or informal norms that have not been tracked in the indicators of the quality of democracy. So it is my view that these countries would actually look much worse in their earlier status in indexes. Another example uh, of things that we don't talk about enough, uh, even if it might seem that we do, are is uh, patronal politics and corruption. Now, corruption is getting more attention and it has been increasingly signaled out as, as a potential break for democratization. This view 
takes corruption beyond its usually analyzed role in diminished state capacity or poor governance or national security. And selective resource distribution can concentrate gains for a narrow range of groups while imposing substantial costs on the rest of the population. This is the situation in Hungary. It has also been mapped by, by researchers. Um, Roger Schumann comes to mind to, 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 for the case of Poland. Um, in Romania, you know, beyond the arrest and conviction of notorious businessmen, ministers, former prime ministers, um, the proximity to public office seems to be such a coveted means for personal enrichment more largely that according to you know, annual reports that we, we get from, a, from this national anti-corruption agency, the number of ministers, parliamentarians, local representatives, and, and directors of these national um, agencies or companies who are sent to trial yearly under corruption charges are in the high tens. So we can infer from this widespread practice that being in government is not an absolute necessity to, to access resources, but proximity to state institutions is. And this background is very important um, to understand what is happening now uh, in, in the EU. As a side note, and we can talk about this more also in the Q&A, the connection between corruption and uh, limited national security was singled out by, by Joe Biden during a visit to Romania in 2014 as his, when he was a vice president, as, his, his, as this country was going through its own elite driven challenges to the rule of law at the time. So at the time, the US Department of State under the Obama administration still had um, liberal democracy on their foreign policy agenda. And um, the election of Joe Biden as the US president sort of retrieves a lost ally to Brussels when it comes to fighting corruption and upholding the rule of law in Eastern Europe. But a snap return to the active pro-democratic policies of the Obama era is not likely. It would also not have instant effects given the advances made by autocrats in, in the meantime. Um, however, uh, uh, US representatives in Eastern European capitals will now most likely reintroduce rule of law and their bilateral agendas, which, which heightens the pressure. Okay, that's a, that was the, the side note. But coming back, we need to see what went wrong in how the fabric of democracy was laid out in the 1990s to understand where problems also arise from now. So to understand the web of interests um, that, that creates a regime and, and directs elite preferences and in countries such as Poland, Hungary, Romania, and Bulgaria, you have basic tenements of EU membership and national constitutions, such as the separation of power, the, the independence of the judiciary, the uh, unlawful allocation of state resources that are formally guaranteed, but are also subverted through informal institutions such as corruption and clientelism. So knowing this, is also helpful to figure out the state of countries knocking at the EU's door with more or, or less conviction. This is not a lecture about that, but um, if you think of, uh, we can also talk about this separately, like researchers of the Western Balkans highlight multiple um, legislative changes that do not get in fact implemented um, um, in, in, in practice. Okay. So, so far, we talked about the challenges coming from the elites or the supply side of anti-democratic policies. But there is also a demand side, underscored by, by the authoritarian attitudes um, at the level of the population. You know, according to polls, overall intolerance is palpably greater in the East. Societies in Central and Eastern Europe are significantly less accepting of Jews and Muslims of sexual minority rights and legal abortion. Um, we have Christian religion that is a key component of national identity. Um, these citizens are also more likely to consider their culture superior. Um, this is a proxy for nationalism. And, and although liberal nationalism permits multi-layered commitments to collective identities and increased intolerance towards di uh, increased tolerance towards diversity, there is a difficult uh, gra to grasp a tipping point when nationalism becomes incompatible 
with liberal democracy and just starts flirting with, with authoritarianism. So people in these countries are inclined to nativist attitudes, more than 80% according to um, polls from, from Pew, uh, Romanians, Bulgarians, more than 80% of Romanians and Bulgarians and Hungarians and Poles consider that being born in or having ancestors uh, from their countries an important component of national identity. This is very different from the 20 something percent uh, from the Swedes or 30 something percent from the Danes that hold similar views. So when you have whole municipalities in Poland declaring themselves LGBTQ free zones, when, when women's reproductive rights are limited and Polish authorities want to limit those even further, uh, when, when gender studies or conversations about gender are no longer allowed in universities in Hungary, and now they're trying to do the same thing in Romania, uh, or when, when signing the Istanbul Convention against discrimination and violence against women is a contested issue in Bulgaria, and you see divisions in the society on who is pro and who is against these issues, um, with the social conservatives taking the lead, we can conclude that uh, different attitudes regarding further progress on human rights issues also remain a major divide between the EU's East and West and, and, and the women and LGBTQ community and non-Christian religious um, denominations will continue to be targeted as second-rate citizens in these countries. Um, not to forget the, the ever more numerous Roma population that lives on the margins of the society under the blind eye of citizens and authorities. So when the supply side meets the demand side, despite years of substantive autocratization like in Poland or Hungary or stalled democratization like in Romania or Bulgaria, the flawed democracies of, of Eastern Europe could still retain a degree of popular legitimacy as they were able to address public demands for economic growth, um, physical, social security, and could generate this diffuse support stemming from ideological, social, conservative claims. And now here comes COVID-19. And Central and Eastern European countries continue to be much worse prepared to deal with the COVID-19 crisis than their Western European counterparts. You have their healthcare systems that are notoriously underfunded. Um, there is a severe shortage of medical personnel. The effects of COVID on the quality of democracy are still to play out. Uh, and we, we have to look at these in a, in a much longer series of time, but a time series, but we have uh, unfortunate hints on how the political systems of Europe's East are uniquely unprepared to deal with the crisis and survive the pandemic without intensified practices or attitudes incompatible with liberal democracy. So the effects of COVID-19 are profoundly affecting these regimes' ability to address popular demands. And should their economic performance no longer be supported by EU financial solidarity mechanisms, national autocrats and then underperforming nationalists might struggle to maintain regime stability. And this is the major fight behind today's headlines in the papers. The, the governments led by Viktor Orban and, and Mateusz Moravci take the spotlight uh, with, with the Slovenian P, uh, Prime Minister Janos uh, Jansa in a supporting cast, a supporting role. Um, so what happened? Now, because we're gonna talk about you, the new bureaucracy, it's gonna get a little bit boring, but I suppose you all read the news. Um, uh, the European Union's push to connect the status of the rule of law uh, with the distribution of EU funding has now made it to the core of the conflict uh, with the new uh, member states. And, and namely Hungary and Poland now strategically hold the, the EU next generation budget hostage by not accepting to link the EU's new rule of law mechanism to the distribution of EU funds. The importance of the rule of law for Europe um, uh, was agreed on in, in well, in an ambiguously constructive uh, conclusions of the July 2020 uh, European Council. But this autumn, 
um, the Commission and the European Parliament reached an agreement on a mechanism to, to cut funding over rule of law concerns. The EU could proceed on this rule of law mechanism despite opposition from the, from the two member states. However, all member states have to, to ratify the bloc's own resource ceilings as part of this multi-annual financial framework, which allows the EU to borrow on capital markets to, to endow the recovery plan. Under the agreement, a decision to cut funds would require the approval of a qualified majority uh, of member countries. Now, a qualified majority is good enough to push through sanctions when needed without Hungary and Poland, but it still requires more than a simple majority, which means that Northern and, and Western European states that are vocal on rule of law issues need the allies in Southeast Europe. So this is interesting, right? I should have convinced you by now that even if other EU member states are not presently in the spotlight on challenges of the rule of law, the conditions for any number of these countries, namely again, Croatia, Armenia, Bulgaria, Slovenia, to have similar attitudes are still there. So only two years ago, Romania was at the center of, of attention for breaking the independence of the judiciary. Now there is a turnover between the Social Democrat Party and the EPP member Liberal Party um, that the new elites in charge of the executives are, are still on, on record for wanting to, quote, reform the constitutional court when the, the judges ruled against some emergency ordinances that circumvented procedures to reduce individual rights during the, the pandemic. And in Bulgaria, you may have seen protests in the streets um, as the chief prosecutor organized a raid and arrests at the offices of the president, who is also the opposition leader, motivated by alleged accusations of corruption. But still, you know, for the time being, these other countries back the rule of law mechanism. So just before we started, I was, I was going through the evening's news and the major story on the Politico EU website is that the Romanian Prime Minister uh, Ludovic Orban is telling Hungary and Poland to back down in the EU budget fight. So while these countries' current executives do not feel targeted by this mechanism at this point, the legal arrangement may also snap into place at a future date and serve to stall democratic degradation here as well. So this highlights the importance of introducing rule of law safeguards beyond the current anti-democratic agendas of just Poland and Hungary. But the EU has slowly advanced from its lack of responses to autocratization in the East. Uh, the advances are, are not major, um, and, but it should take advantage that these other countries do not directly support Hungary and Poland in their stance right now to push forward. However, down the road, they will need to coalesce with these countries to implement sanctions. So in a way, the concept of failing forward that other people have, have pushed in, the, in, in political science comes to mind in trying to understand the EU's current predicament. The partially uh, successful introduction of rule of law constraints on, on EU funds distribution depends on whether EU leaders, Western European democracies and European People's Party in particular, prioritize European liberal values over immediate political stability. So the pressure has never been higher for EU institutions to discontinue their accommodating stance towards authoritarian attitudes in its Eastern half. I don't know if you want to know more about how exactly uh, this um, agreement uh, works, but you can ask me, uh, or, or how can can the the rule of law be separated from um, from the um, uh, recovery and resilience facility? <clears throat> but we can talk about that later as well. Okay. Now the second wave of the pandemic is hitting Central and Eastern European hard. Uh, but this has had a, a more diverse impact on global supply chains compared to the first wave. And it is in this context that we are discussing about the possibility of, um, of, of separating um, and of creating an intergovernmental agreement uh, that, um, that allows 
the EU to give money to deal with COVID, despite these countries not being um, accepting, not accepting the, the rule of law mechanism. So for this reason, and because the new anti-coronavirus measures are, are less restrictive and, and, and large factories such as automakers that are very important for Eastern Europe are no longer shutting down, uh, the impact on their economy is likely to be less pronounced. However, um, Europe's local currencies are, are highly sensitive to global factors and the dynamics in the Eurozone. So their economies are also dependent on those in Western Europe. So this makes them particularly vulnerable to disruptions in international production uh, chains and exports. And an ample government intervention will continue to keep economies afloat, but the transfer of funds, of EU funds to Central Eastern European Union will be absolutely necessary to scale up public investment. And any delays in approving the next generation EU a uh, recovery fund will stall spending for these necessary public investments. This is not a unique Eastern European problem. All European countries need this agreement to increase the EU's own resources ceiling. But, but as I mentioned before, these particular Eastern European elites are very reluctant to give up power, to be voted out of office. And, Despite that, you know, poor governance continues to dog public projects in, in Central and Eastern and, and, and South Eastern Europe, but we can continue to, and we can continue to expect implementation delays and cost overruns, even as funds are being released. But for the countries that are most dependent on EU funding, um, such as, as Hungary, Weakened economic prospects represent a major threat to nationalist Prime Minister Viktor Orban. I mentioned before that as he prepares um, to face parliamentary elections in the first half of 2022, he's currently enhancing his re-election chances by modifying the electoral system to disadvantage his political opposition. So we've had this theory in political science um, that warns about a particular kind of policy mix that authoritarian or authoritarian inclined leaders use to maintain power. This combines um, diffuse leg legitimation that I've also hinted at when I was talking about the convergence between the demand side and the supply side, repression um, that uh, we can uh, discuss about how on many ways in which uh, these countries have uh, limited individual freedoms, freedom of media and co-optation which takes place at the level of the civil society. I have talked about uh, the example of the business elites that are co-opted into a public procurement um, and, and so on. So when it comes to this particular semi-autocratic regime, it kind of fits the bill. Um, and, and I'm currently working together with uh, uh, Dorothy Bolle from the EY to map this policy mix in the case of these countries under the pressure of COVID. And, and here what we claim, and this is bold, uh, is that, that the longer the crisis, the greater the challenges faced by, by, the, by these rulers uh, to successfully balance between uh, legitimation, uh, cooptation and, and repression, and thus to maintain regime stability. But in the meantime, Orban stands to win re-election. And that's, that's the reality. Uh, polls are putting Fidesz, Fidesz at 50% approval rating right now. Um, so you see on the one hand, what were we talking about these days that is happening in Europe? You, if you stop the funding for Hungary, you may destabilize the regime because the population no longer receives what they are, um, what they expect to receive in public goods, but it will hurt the people in the process. So any delays in approving uh, this uh, recovery fund will stall spending like, like for necessary public investments and will obstruct uh, the economic recovery to pre-pandemic levels. But on the other hand, you know, continuing to provide funding to Hungary will likely reinforce the regime. So, you know, what would you do? Uh, I think I spoke quite a lot. So let me draw some conclusion and, and, and predict the future. Um, these governments in the region will, will continue to be among uh, the least trusted and, and state capacities will remain among the lowest. There is no way that that can be avoided right now. And although you see 
issue-based protests. So for women's reproductive rights in Poland uh, or anti-corruption in, in Romania and Bulgaria, occasionally sparking in the region, showing civil society mobilization. And, and I don't want to downplay the importance of this, but there is no significant oppositional wave to a variegated swing towards liberal democracy. So the European Union will continue to be under pressure to confront anti-human rights attitudes among the elite and the population regardless of whether they push forward the mechanism of the rule of law. So this is, this is not something that we have to think that will solve all the problems, even if the EU decides to, to, to go to separate the uh, rule of law from the distribution of funding through um, intergovernmental arrangements. So I hold these truths to be self-evident. Truth number one. I strongly think that the evolutions of, of regimes and the quality of democracy in, in Eastern Europe is not an exciting thing to watch, you know, unless you have a fascination with regime building and, and the study of painstakingly slow processes of democratization and de-democratization. These countries are a perfect laboratory of institutional and societal uh, change, and they should be on the agenda of any researcher who deals with this. But, you know, it's just regime building. We have many books on that, and then it's states. It's just states. What is exciting is how these countries get to shape the rule of law culture and the values of a whole continent who, I mean, speaking of Europe, who even if it's if it's small and has lost a lot of, of its clout, it's still, together with North America, the bearer of the, the democratic flame. So in the upcoming ideological confrontation with, with China, this will matter. So truth number two, there was a lot of faking and a lot of self-delusion going on in the enlargement process. Um, Eric and I have a, have a paper on this that will hopefully come out soon. The research for this paper um, led us to talk with, with many of those involved, um, and it's, it was quite a trip. Uh, as Eastern candidates thought that they were liberal because they were anti-communist, but in fact they were just neoconservatives. And then the, at the same time, Western democracy is making the decision for enlargement faked a sort of omnipotence, uh, like, in a, like in a Jim Morrison type of attitude, the West is the best, come here and we'll do the rest. And there has been a lot of marvelous and, and less marvelous improvisation ever since. And truth number three, thank God for that, because in the absence of EU membership, the citizens living in these Eastern territories of the EU would have been much, much further east of Eden. So, so thank you, that's it, that's all I got. Um, now you tell me what you wanna know and more importantly, um, what I got wrong. Terrific, Veronica, thank you very much. That was really great. Hope um, I didn't take too much time. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. Um, I, would, uh, I, I would like to open it up for questions. But when I do that, what I want is to suggest to people who are attending that you put your questions in the Q&A box, not in the chat box, because we're going to follow the Q&A box for questions. You'll find the Q&A box or the chat box, but you only want the Q&A box. Uh, by hovering your mouse over your screen, that should activate the control bar at the bottom of the screen and the Q&A is clearly labeled uh, with two different sets of question bubbles. So if you'll put your questions in there, what I'm gonna do, I, I know Sean has asked a couple of questions already, but before I get to Sean's questions, Veronica, I wanna ask you a couple of questions myself that are based really on these final comments that you made. Um, one question is uh, inspired by an, uh, an op-ed in Politico uh, that Dan Kellerman wrote, and I can see Dan is in the audience right now. Uh, and, and, <clears throat> and Dan concludes this op-ed about Poland and Hungary, encouraging both the EPP 
uh, the European People's Party and, and the European Union as a whole to take on the, the Hungarian and Polish regimes that push back against this. Uh, and I guess my question is, is that going to get us the effect that we want, or is that just going to galvanize support for them domestically? Now, that's one part of the question. The other part of the question is, um, Dan has argued, I think, quite persuasively that you can separate the, the rule of law conversation from everything else, uh, because the rule of law conversation as a legislative conversation uh, can be done under qualified majority voting and, and, and indeed has been done. So, so given that you can separate it that way, is there, isn't there really a basic need for these funds, both in Pung Poland and Hungary and elsewhere, that makes this a very weak hand for them to play this obstructionism? Or, or should we not underestimate their willingness uh, to obstruct this because they're so fearful uh, of what this rule of law provision could entail in terms of regime stability? Where do you fall on that delicate balance? Okay, so I'm glad to hear that Dan is here. He'll probably give us a strong lecture on this. Um, he's been doing such a great job putting everyone in their place. Uh, so it's, it's, ha it's hard not to accept many of his views because he's been so influential uh, in creating them. Um, so I don't... This is a very complicated mess. So it's not so so unnuanced. And I, the way that the EU is going to solve it, it's, it's gonna be very, very important. And it's very unlikely that they will not have such a strong attitude like many people ask them, ask them to have. When you ask if the rule of law, um, to play the rule of law card, um, is uh, I mean is it's a, is, that is a weak play for for the countries of, of Eastern Europe. I'm thinking from the, you already know like the, what is in the self interest of elites. Like if you are Viktor Orban right now and you know that you're going to accept the rule of law mechanism and then the rule of law mechanism is going to enter into force and you're not getting funds anyway. Why not play this card? I know it's not that easy because they're still going to get funds in different ways. So you might as well show the strength that you've sort of already accustomed everyone to have when you're at 50% approval ratings in your uh, community and you have the power to still change the law to the extent that you will get even, even more, right? So they can even change the constitution. I mean, there's not, why not do it? It's a, uh, I'm, I know that this, this just sounds a bit uh, well, well to self-interested because they are hurting the interests of their citizens. But I don't think that Viktor Orban is gonna change. Uh, and, and then the fact that even if you were to accept this, let's say watered down agreement on the rule of law between the parliament and the commission, nothing is gonna change in, in Hungary they are holding so much of the power in every aspect of, of life um, and in the different levels of the state that is just, I mean, it makes sense that they're doing what they're doing right now. And, um, and it's quite similar, maybe less entrenched, but it's quite similar in Poland. Um, so in, in a way, I think that, you know, it's, it's not a weak play they were gonna get uh, at some point, some sort of pushback. So I do agree uh, with, with Dan that um, uh, the EU has, has to do something because we've met, talked about this before. We can't look at the EU with, with wishful thinking and we can't see it as something that no longer is. If it's just a mechanism of some sort of economic uh, stability in the region, then it's not what it was supposed to be and it stops being the EU. And if you do not have the ideological pull for these countries as well, apart from the economic one, then your raison d'etre is no longer there anyway. So, I mean, this is, this is this, it's an important moment for, for them to, um, to do something right now. And I, I'm really, I mean, I'm, I'm grateful to Dan and for many others for pushing them to do so. So let me just, let me just get to Sean's first question in this context, because I want to understand what it is that you're saying. Um, Sean asks, you know, did enlargement 
uh, dilute European democratic values. Uh, and, and I think that's the right question to ask because if, if they're gonna take on Viktor Orban, they're taking on a majority of the Hungarian population, right? And they're taking on a very popular government and they're making them do something that the people don't want. So, so isn't there a tension there at some level? There is a tension, but this is always a tension between the preferences and the interests of these people. So, okay, it sounds, um, if you think that the EU is a democracy, uh, the European Union is a democracy and everybody has an equal say, and then countries uh, have the right to veto a decision and they have the mandate of the, the legitimacy of the vote and they have the mandate of the parliament, which both uh, Poland and Hungary have to push for this. So they are you know, using uh, uh, democratic instruments against the democracy of their countries. So that is not really something that is unheard of. Uh, it's not even very original. It's it's part of the it's it's the dictator's manual to how to make a better dictatorship. So um, this isn't. Um, I forgot. I mean, what, what was the question? Whether it dilutes, it dilutes <laughs> whether it dilutes the, European democratic values. But I, but I want to pivot the question at this point, right? Because. Uh, Marta Pardavi has asked a question along these lines that I think is really useful for us uh, to, to push this along. And what she says is, well, wait a minute, you know, this morning, Ivan Krastev pointed out that for, from Viktor Orban's perspective, there's a legitimate reason to be pushing back against the rule of law mechanism because it's constraining national sovereignty and majoritarian democracy. So, so would you argue that Viktor Orban's reasoning in that context is wrong, that, that, that it is not a legitimate reason for him to be pushing back? So referring to the sovereignty of nations is something that social conservatives do, and I'm not surprised Ivan Krastev uh, took this position. Um, and, um, and, and of course, as long as you understand the EU in the traditional way, that is just a set of a set of states and the, the, with the card territory and a particular nation um, and that have the sovereignty over, over everyone. And there's a sort of a majority rule or um, like Marius wrote in the chat that uh, there's a plurality of citizens, not, not a majority who elected, um, who elected um, Orban. Um, yeah, then sure. Uh, if, it, it's, if it's a group of states and everyone can opt out and you have this sort of differentiated European integration, then let's do that if that is what these countries want. Is this a good thing? I don't think it is. Are the citizens going to suffer? Of course they are. But if this is what we are going for and we're just going to have an enhanced uh, cooperation on the rule of law, then then let's call it that way. But this is no longer the European Union. So Marta had a had a follow up point in this that that I think is useful. You had two different sets of issues that you raised in your conversation. One was an issue about corruption and the abuse of public office, and the other issue is the one that we're talking about right now. Shouldn't we distinguish cleanly between these because? The corruption and abuse of public office issue, I think, is one that we can all agree should be pushed back against. But this is not about that. This is about differences, fundamental differences uh, in, in the way people perceive how democracy should function and the people should be represented, isn't it? I don't think that these two are, are, are separated. I think... Um... Uh, they are uh, the same, the two sides of the same coin. So when you use corruption to also um, diminish the, the separation of the equilibrium of, power, of powers in the state, then how are these two not connected? Uh, you, through corrupt means or through these informal institutions that I'm trying to look at, a single party centralized power. And it created such an imbalance that it is able now to um, dilute uh, the, the justice system and the response to these, to these issues, to dilute access to state resources. So it's no longer equitable, even in the idea of the separation of the economy and, and politics, which is also a definition of, of liberal democracies. So I can understand why everyone would say okay, corruption is, is a problem that's different. It's about um, uh, state capacity, it's about uh, uh, governance, it's not about democracy. But there is a 
clear connection that I've been trying to show myself between corruption and stability um, uh, and equilibrium uh, among the powers. And, and when the executive uses the mechanisms of corruption to aggrandize their own, their, their own power, then um, no, I don't see that these two are separated and they should be, should be linked in all analysis. And they are also, I would like to say that it's not particularly original. Uh, corruption is um, a measure in many of the, of the indexes that already exist on the market on, on the status of liberal democracy. So this, this gets back to the second part of Sean's uh, initial question, which is, okay, if we, if we take this, then what, what, what you're arguing, it seems to be, that the influence of these informal networks or these informal institutions, uh, the, the corruption as it feeds into the democratic process is really what we should be focusing on if we're gonna distinguish between democracy uh, and authoritarianism, right? Because we're, we're not only focusing on formal constitutional arrangements, uh, we're focusing on how constitutions and society are interconnected. Is that, uh, did I understand that correctly? Yes. Okay. Um, <laughs> now, the, the reason I wanted to push that is because uh, what Sean is saying is that, you know, look, the United States doesn't seem to be as attractive as a model anymore. Uh, China and Russia seem to be trying to interfere with the way dem democracies function. So what are we supposed to advocate? Because this tangled nest of issues that you describe and this important role of these informal institutions uh, that you characterize these seem to be relatively hard for us to, to manipulate or even to advocate in any kind of clear fashion. So the question is, what is the best way to get out of this or, or what? When Absolutely. <laughs> what is the best way out, right? <laughs> so here's the question, you know, what is the solution? What do we do? Um, I think that uh, we desperately, desperately need to rethink these systems without the care of preserving current um, schemes that are underpinning the idea of, of the nation state. We have to do something um, that puts the individual back at the center of policy. And I know this sounds like super grand and, and so on, but, but it's not because even if we talk about, or even if like the, the, the op-ed that you quoted about like, okay, states have sovereignty, States have sovereignty as long as they decide to have sovereignty. Europe has sovereignty as long as Europe decides to have sovereignty. Who is Europe? Europe is the citizens that make up Europe. So I don't wanna get into a philosophical argument, but as long as we obsess about the fact that, that it's important what these governments do for their people and you don't supersede these governments and just focus on the people who just inhabit, just happen to inhabit these territories, we're not gonna make any progress. So for example, when you talk about taking funds away from central governments, there are mechanisms um, uh, in the, um, the direct, the regional directorate, for example, how, how, I remember how it called Johannes Hahn was the, uh, the, the, the commissioner for a long time. Th there are mechanisms that can distribute funds to regions, to cities, that can bypass this idea that there are centralized governments that solve everything and that they have this know-how on how to do it. So there are things, but you know, you have to have a political and to politicize um, incredibly the European Union um, and, and, and go back to the, to the core of, of cosmopolitanism, uh, federalism and constitutionalism uh, that we uh, all used to love about the EU. So, so maybe I should slice this a slightly different way, and I'm going to I'm going to pick up a question from Gabriel Gluckner. Uh, great to see you on board, Gabriel. By the way, um, the the question from Gabriel is: Isn't this just a problem of the moment? Because younger people don't they have different values, and aren't they these these people who are supporting regimes like the Orban regime? Uh, aren't, aren't they just going to age out eventually? At which point we'll we'll have a different kind of elite and a different kind of elite behavior. 
So I don't know um, Gabriel's uh, and 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 his his age and how much patience he has until uh, you know generations die out until the new generations come in. Uh, but this is again one of those problems about complacency, about waiting for something to to naturally happen and for taking for granted that the attitudes of a uh, younger generation, which is also not that clear. There's a lot of intersectionality there about whether it's a rural population or um, the population of cities. Um, uh, and there's also a difference. So there's no guarantee that these generations right now, just because they have a different view on, on things because they've been on Erasmus and you know, have Erasmus babies and so on, uh, that they don't necessarily going to preserve the same preferences forever. So no, I would say that we desperately need to be exceptionally active and to, to sell, um, not us, I mean us as well, but, uh, but the decision makers to sell the product that, that, is, that is Europe and to sell the product that is tolerance and, and um, multi-layered commitments and diversity and, and so on. So. I most definitely, uh, I don't see, and I don't see the, the, that there are trends in history, if we look back, that are so clear uh, going forward that, that we see now that cosmopolitanism uh, or federalism is, is inevitable. On the contrary, there's a rise of nationalism and it feels like it's, it's just going to live there uh, forever. So, so I think this is a bit more optimistic and allows me to bring in two different points. One raised in the chat. Don't please don't use the chat though. Use the Q and A thing. But I'm going to Marius because it's you. I'm going to make an accepted uh, by Marius Ginchip uh, and 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 also by Dan Kellerman. And that is that Marius says, look, you know, it's not really a majority of the Hungarian population that supports Fidesz. Fidesz won by significantly less than a majority. It's just the gerrymandered nature of the electoral system that amplified the Fidesz vote. And in that sense, there are other voices in, in Hungary that we should listen to. And, and, and Dan says, you know, yeah, and by the way, aren't there also other pro-democratic voices uh, in Central Europe? Couldn't they play a role in debunking the rhetoric from Orban and Kaczynski that this is an East-West struggle, struggle and instead uh, reveal it for what it is, which is a struggle over the nature of democracy or the nature of political authority between Democrats and authoritarians? Um, so I think you changed a bit Marius's question, but uh, <laughs> it's fine. And so uh, when, when we, we do, there's right, there's not maybe a question there. He just makes a good point because um, uh, there is this problem of the institutions as well. It's not it's not just the people who are there, uh, the parties that are there. And, and, and Dan is right. I'm glad that he's more optimistic than I am. I never thought that that could happen, um, that there are other forces and liberal forces that could could move this conversation differently or who could take the place um, of these parties. Um, but just like Marius observed, uh, the institutions uh, and the cards are stacked against them seriously. Not only uh, is the opposition fragmented in Poland, in Hungary, even in Romania, um, uh, in, in Bulgaria, not that much, uh, but not only are they fragmented, but they have all these institutions and this mammoth overlap between business, media, access to information, um, access to, um, uh, to possibility of disinformation, access to resources that are just highly stacked against the people who want to do things differently. And, and if you think of, um, of a case we've been looking at, at recently uh, that has just brought a lot of hope uh, for Eastern Europe outside the EU in the Republic of Moldova with the election of, the, of Maya Sandu as the president and everybody's happy. Is this a, a new direction for this small country in, in the East? And, and it's, a, it's a great result, but it has very small significance in the scale of the troubles um, uh, in that country, as well as she does not have the powers as the president to change anything. So without going into a whole conversation about it, um, I would say that, yes, there are plenty of, of people who want to see things differently. The society is polarized. The fact that you have these outcomes in Poland um, or in Hungary does not 
mean in any way that this is the whole face of, of these countries. You have a very active diaspora in the West, in the case of Romania, that has defined elections many times. So you do have all these um, different um, um, directions in which groups pull. Uh, but um, for the time being, uh, without the structure of the EU, I come back to the EU to help with the way that the institutions are currently fixed against these challengers, um, we're going to have a problem. And another point, um, there aren't that many, let's, I mean, the populism or whatever they put under the umbrella of populism in, in these countries or extremism is not that that high for the time being, like in Romania uh, or even Bulgaria. It's just run off the mill corruption nationalism that we've all grown up with. Uh, but but very extreme voices are still marginalized, and then that's still that's still quite good. But the conditions are there for a further radicalization of the discourse. So we have to pay attention uh, to, uh, to matters getting worse, not to things getting better. But that, that brings me to a question that John Uger uh, is, uh, is raising, which is, you know, if polarization is the sort of most toxic force that's leading us uh, down this path, well, what are the remedies, right? How do we stop these countries from spilling over into a more polarized environment? Uh, and, and, and instead keep them in that delicate balance that you've just characterized right now where they're corrupt, but they're sort of okay with it. Oh, I don't, I, did I say that we should keep them in the balance where they're corrupt? And well, okay. No, but we don't want them to get worse, right? <laughs> we don't want them to get worse and that's why we should pay attention for them not to get worse. But again, the matter of complacency, this is not the best that it can possibly be. Uh, so the problem of polarization is, is, a, is a major issue, right? It's, it's worse in the US because of the electoral system, but it's a big deal in, in Eastern Europe as well. And, and, and not just in East and the West as well for different reasons. But one of the main reasons is that people are becoming so, um, so polarized when it comes to uh, their set of values. It's, you, you can no longer speak to a, a conservative without losing your mind and probably they feel the same if they were to talk to me. So it, it's very complicated to engage across the aisle. Let's, let's put it this way. Uh, so some of the, um, some, some of the solutions that, that have come up um, is this idea of having a proportional representation, the fact that you can still build coalitions, um, uh, that you have the structures of the government, of the executive, of the parliament uh, that manages to put these people together. And it has been shown that these kind of systems marginalize uh, those who have way you know, different ideas um, uh, or, or very radical ideas when they are in government. Um, so, or when they're not in government. So um, this is a big conversation. I mean, what is it better? Do you give them a platform to express themselves so people can see them failing? Or, or do you create this uh, gatekeeping, you safeguard uh, the uh, the executive uh, and you never coalesce with with any party that is way too much on the extreme um, and I think that mm, the the discipline is divided but there is a, a growing consensus in the on the idea of keeping them uh, apart okay, creating a cordon um, uh, against uh, any kind of parties that are too or movements that are uh, that are too radical, and if they exist, then you better let them, um, you know, shut them up. But that that kind of cordon sanitaire approach didn't didn't work all that well in Western Europe. I guess maybe we could think about this institutionally. I have in the questions uh, two different possibilities. One would be to to run the funding for the recovery and resilience facility outside of the general institutional framework and make it a, a, an enhanced cooperation type endeavor that left Hungary and Poland out in the cold. Uh, the other would be to take the rule of law issue and put that into a separate 
category and have an independent agency monitor that as opposed to trying to run it through EU institutions. Are either of these institutional solutions likely to be a way forward? Um, uh, sure, I think, I mean, we have, we've touched upon this, um, and I think that most, the light, most likely one is that the EU will introduce the, will take the, the rule of law idea and give it a prime spot, or at least they should, because that is something uh, to, to consider for the future, whereas these kind of um, um, agreements to distribute funding um, are more are more common so it's not the first time that the EU would do this I think a similar method was used in was used in 2012 uh, to pass the the fiscal compact after the UK vetoed it so um, um, yeah this uh, governmental agreement could refer specifically to the recovery and resilience facility um, aimed at, at tackling the effects of, of COVID-19. Um, and and the practically, I don't I don't even think actually that you can go back on the agreement between the Parliament and the Commission on the rule of law. Uh, so that is that's quite. I'm, I mean, it's it's pretty much settled. You can um, dilute it very much, uh, but um, the, the the conversation now is more on a symbolic level. It it would seem to me because the rule of law is already integrated somehow in the in the mechanisms of the EU and now they just have to agree on the distribution of funds um, and and if they don't the, the, they veto it then yeah then we have the other option so um, I think it's becoming quite clear sure they can they can find new innovative ways to underperform again but um, but this seems to be like the most reasonable solution right now. Do you think <clears throat> within the, the context of that solution that we may actually even be interpreting uh, or, or misinterpreting the motives of some of the key actors? Uh, Marius has come up with a different question, which is, you know, what do you say about the argument that the Polish conservatives needed to adopt a strong conservative populist illiberal platform in order to build a coalition large enough to allow them to adopt, uh, adopt economic policies that go against the neoliberal toolbox? Uh, this would mean that, that what they're doing is really just a cover uh, for, for uh, an economic strategy that's different from the neoliberal orthodoxy. If that's true, maybe giving them money and allowing them to be more interventionist is, is all they really want. So I don't, um, I, don't, I don't think that these people, and I don't know that much about the, directly about the Polish case, but I've spoken to, to many in, in the Hungarian government, um, and they are—they're not not conservative, so they do make this decision based on economic reasons. But at the same time, they do believe they're—they're they're not completely faking their belief in these conservative values. They are actually integrating them uh, to a large extent in their. Um, I mean, the perception of, of living conservatively and, and pushing for these conservative, um, let's call them conservative, I call them anti-human rights um, uh, attitudes within these governments. So I don't think it's a cover up if I understood the question correctly. Um, uh, they are just, I mean, they're doing, doing at the same time. It's uh, they're in many ways just uh, features of, uh, of, of conservative traits. I, can I also say something from the chat? I don't want to overlook the fact that um, uh, uh, Daniel said that Krastev is completely wrong, um, just to, to, to score that point, and then he gives an explanation. Okay. I was, I was going to get, I knew you wanted to get to that, <clears throat> but, uh, but uh, I, I, I want to draw you on two other issues. Um, one is from Jada, and that's about the role of Russia, right? You know, is, is what role is Russia playing, and could better dialogue between the EU and Russia actually make the situation a little bit better? Um, the other is from James Colligan, uh, which is, you know, what is the role of Germany? Does Germany have a strategy here for dealing with this? Uh, and and if it doesn't, then why doesn't it have a strategy? Because this would seem to be a major, majorly important thing for for Germany to want to manage. The rule of law. 
or what? The whole no. the whole conflict, right? The the, the, the Europe. <laughs> no, 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 no. The recovery and resilience facility, probably most important, but the rule of law issue uh, issue wrapped around it. Okay, so um, um, on this point about Germany, don't take them the the other way because we started. Um, the way that I mean, everyone looks at Germany now, not just because it's Germany, but also because of the, the influence it has within the uh, European People's Party. So through um, uh, the European People's Party is where uh, where Germany should should really have a huge uh, huge role in in meeting this the uh, the requirements of 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 the manifesto of the EPP when it comes to who is supposed to be within the EPP and who's supposed to be um, out of the EPP. So Germany definitely has a significant role here because of the way um, these parties function. And, and we know that there is a direct connection between uh, the chancellor and, 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 uh, the, and Ursula von der Leyen. So, uh, that, that is the role, and I think, I mean, Germany is trying to, to play it through uh, these mechanisms of the EU, although um, Angela Merkel has also expressed uh, some sort of, I mean, she was quite, uh, quite vocal on this, but she's letting these other people speak, um, like Weber or, or, um, or von der Leyen. Um, and I, I think that that is also the voice of, of part of Germany, if not all of Germany. So um, on the other question about Russia, the role of, of Russia in this, where there's like they're having a field day, come on. I mean, Russia is doing so little and they're getting so much. I'm starting to, uh, you know, I, I think I, we need to learn from them. Um, and because of of how little energy they put into things and then how much they get out of and it's not just what they get out of uh, what's happening in the US but also any kind of fragmentation within the EU um, is is in Russia's is in Russia's interest because they want a weaker uh, European Union they want a weaker transatlantic relation um, they want them to be weaker uh, economically so, we are overestimating Russian capacity to um, interfere in, let's say, in, in directly like cyber attacks in in, um, um, in the elections. Or I mean, we're talking a lot about Russian capacities. They don't have Russian capacities at the level that the U.S. has, or or even at the level that the EU has. But they have <laughs> a lot of um, of potential to uh, to use these wedges that exist in the society through campaigns of disinformation and misinformation and just and they're just relishing the, the, the fact that these divisions exist they just put more gas on the fire um, that's one thing and then the second thing is that everybody looks at that Russia at any kind of potential armed conflict or, or whatever that could happen in the uh, eastern part and then particularly in uh, the Black Sea um, um, or, or in the north and and they're looking at that and there's a lot of um, a lot of activity there's been troops moving through um, uh, the NATO in, in eastern part on the eastern flank from out of Germany. There have been more funds uh, for uh, defense spending, not that much, but a lot. Um, but in the end, that's not the actual problem or a lot of governments in, in Europe um, don't actually see, uh, for good reason, I think, an armed conflict with, with Russia as a possibility. The, the great problem with Russia is just the fact that we are, we are just falling into their, um, we, the, the, whatever, the West, uh, are just falling into, into their hands because we have our problems and our problems are just success stories for the Russians. So this brings me really to our last question. And this has been a fabulous conversation. I've learned a huge amount. Uh, and this question, what I'm going to do is marry together um, Marius's point from the chat with Dan's point from the Q&A about Krostev being wrong, right? So Marius in the chat refers to the 2010 electoral system in Hungary that allowed Viktor Orban's Fidesz 
uh, to dominate with a, with a plurality of the vote, but not an outright majority. And then as we know, Fidesz used its time in office in order to change institutions uh, and, and contest the 2014 and 2018 elections. And Dan points out that, that these were neither free nor fair. And so my question to you is really twofold. Um, you know, if we admit that, that Orban did come to power through free and fair elections in 2010, but somehow that situation changed in, in the aftermath, then, then when was the appropriate time for the European Union to intervene in order to stop this digression or, 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 or deterioration of Hungarian democracy? Uh, and, and crucially, in the same time, uh, is it now too late, right? Because the institutions have been changed so substantially to allow for elections that are not free and fair. Uh, so can the European Union really reverse the political facts on the ground in Hungary at this point? Uh, or, or, or are we in a different, different situation altogether? No, the European Union cannot do anything on its own well, because the European Union is not a, um, I mean, it's, it's not a, a unitary actor that can make all the difference. It is one of the actors that can act to produce some change. Um, and of course, it's not too late. It won't change anything from one day to the next, but uh, there's no way that they shouldn't, um, shouldn't act in the direction that we're telling them to do, <laughs> act right now and through our writings, uh, because that would, uh, that would give a moment of respite to, to the citizens. And the fact that these citizens are not all uh, sort of on, in, the, in, the, in the, um, supporting the, um, uh, the outcomes of, of these governments uh, is a big deal. I mean, I didn't want to downplay it. I'm just, in the short run, these countries are not looking well with intervention from the EU, with support towards civil society, with extra support from the US who could be back in the values game, uh, with, with more um, um, solidarity mechanisms, and yes, with the acceptance that for the time being, we do have differentiated uh, and differentiated integration process. Um, then, yeah, we could, we could rethink a bit and just gain more time, um, not until the population changes, but until the population mixes more and more um, in the EU um, uh, and, and then address economic difficulties. So I don't know when you say, when should have the EU um, done more? The EU should have always done more, but not just the EU, the, the, the countries and then the and the people in these countries should also have done more and we should have done more. I mean, as researchers, we kind of failed a lot of people with what we've been putting out in the, on the market lately. And particularly considering who are the people who have stolen the conversation on what we're supposed to do. Uh, so we're not going to talk again about uh, who's wrong, uh, but we do have to think in much more innovative ways and in ways that at the same time are speaking again to the core of, of the youth of the European Union. And, um, and, and so, you know, it, it's a concerted effort uh, and it's constant. So there's no something that you could do now or you could have done at some point uh, to leverage the game. It's just a constant struggle and, uh, you know, happy that we can do it together. Well, Veronica, I, I'm only sorry that you're not gonna get to hear the usual round of applause. Uh, we've had audience members from, from across Europe, uh, substantial representations from, from Lewis in Rome, from the European University Institute, and from our own community at SAIS. And on behalf of all of them, uh, I'd like to thank you for what was really a fabulous uh, and very stimulating conversation. Uh, we hope we can get you back again soon, and I look forward to working with you again next semester. Thank you, Eric, and thank you, humans of size and beyond. I'm more sorry that we didn't get to do the Prosecco after the lecture, which is the <laughs> favorite moment after the lectures, but we'll do it next time. So thanks again for the invitation and the awesome questions. Excellent, thanks. And thanks. goodbye, everyone. I hope you'll come and join us again for, for our talks. We have a series of talks
next week as well. And you can find us at uh, BIPR.eu. Thank you. Bye-bye.